Hi and welcome to another Essential Lightroom tutorial. In this video guide, I'm going to take you through and show you the basics of working inside Lightroom CC. This is a super quick start guide. It's going to give you up to speed as quick as possible. So if you're new to Lightroom or you're used to working with Lightroom CC Classic, then stick around because this is going to get you where you need to be quickly and easily. So let's take a look at Lightroom CC in action. So at the moment, we're in the gallery module of Lightroom CC. And as you can see, I've got a range of images that I can go through and select and choose to start editing. If we look on the left hand side, you can see all of the albums that I have synchronized across my cloud account. So let's use this particular image. I'm going to click on there, press D on the keyboard to go to the develop module. And that takes us in so we can start editing the image. If I want to close this left hand panel down, I can simply click on this little My Photos box or press P on the keyboard and that'll close it down. Now the interface is pretty simple, easily laid out and quite accessible. Across the left hand side is all to do with dealing with your photographs. At the top we can search for Adobe stock images. Down the bottom we've got different ways of viewing our photo grid. We've also got the ability to rate and rank the images, the image that we're looking at on screen. We've got a couple of options for how we see the image on screen so we can fit, we can go to fill, we can go to one to one so it'll see it full size. We can use the hand icons, we just simply hold the left mouse button down, drag that around and see the image and we can easily just jump back out to that to fit. We've also got the option then to show or hide the film strip, which is basically the same kind of view as when you're in the gallery, just shrunk down to a little film strip at the bottom. So any folder you're looking in on your Lightroom catalog, that's what you'll see displayed here. You can see I can scroll across left and right in there. I can show and hide that easily just by clicking on this or pressing the forward slash key on the keyboard. So that's the film strip on and off. Finally on there, we've got the option to show the original. So we start making edits, we can easily use that to take a look at what the image was like before the edits, press it again to take us back. If we take a look on the right hand side, there are all the tools that we've got to start editing the image. We'll take a look at those in a moment. If we take a look at the bottom, we can tag any of the images, we can add keywords to these, so we can then start to use keywords to search through our catalogs and find images that are all using the same keyword. So for example, we could use mountain views, we could use lakes, we could use person, whatever you kind of want, and then you can group your images and search based upon that keyword. We then finally got the info button, which gives us information about the image that we currently have open. So you can see this gives us all the copyright information, any information that's stored, any meta information that's stored as part of the image, including what camera it was shot on, what lens, what focal length, and so on. Again, we can close that down. Finally, right at the top, we've got the option to simply upload to the cloud or share with the cloud, and we've got the option to synchronize and backup. So that's the basics of the interface. Let's take a look at some of the options we have available and start editing this image and see what we can do with it. So if we click on any of these icons on the right hand side, that will op open up the corresponding tools and panels that are associated with that particular section. So as you can see, this is our basic editing section. So we can come in, we can adjust anything to do with the light of the image, the color, effects, detail, optics and geometry. If we expand any of those out, you can see we have a range of tools and options available in there. And depending on which panel you've got open, you'll have additional switches. So you can see at the moment we have the tone curve open. We can get rid of that just by click clicking on the tone curve icon, bring it back up by clicking again. So very simple, easy interface to work with. And we can streamline it if we want to, if there are too many things open that we don't want to use. So let's take a look at some of the basic tools we have available in here. So you can see we've got exposure, contrast, highlight, shadows, whites and blacks. This is how we can deal with all the tonal information in the image. So for example, if we've got an image that's under or overexposed, we can easily use the exposure slider by dragging it to the left will reduce the exposure by dragging it to the right will increase the exposure. And you can see we get a value at the top. If we want to input something directly, we can simply click in there, type in the value we want, and you can see pressing enter or return on the keyboard will commit that. Now, everything you do inside Lightroom CC is completely non-destructive. So all of these edits will make no permanent effect to the image that you're working with. So you can edit and adjust to your heart's content, and you can come back in a day, a year, whatever, come back into Lightroom and you can edit that image again with none of those changes committed permanently to the actual file. So it's like working with a digital negative. It's all we're going to retain its original source details, information, all the settings and everything that are associated with it. So very easy. If you want to reset any of these values, you can simply double click on the little slider and that'll take you back to its default value pretty quick and easy. 
We've also got the auto option, which will take a look at the image and decide what it thinks is going to be the best based upon looking at tens of thousands of images that are all based around the same kind of content. There's sort of artificial intelligence that's been introduced into the recent version of Lightroom CC that helps get better basic auto adjustments. So you can click on that and you can see that goes, takes a look what it thinks is a good starting point. Like I say, non-destructive, so you can edit this to your heart's content. So if you want to reset this back to its original, we just need to press Shift and R on the keyboard. That resets everything or reverts it back to its original. So again, like I say, very easy. So let's take a look at making some basic alterations to this and seeing what they do. So exposure, as we already know, will increase or decrease the exposure. That's pretty cool, but we've got lots of other tools. Contrast is going to do exactly what its name suggests. It's going to look at the edges between the lightest and the darkest, and then it'll increase the contrast between those to give you a much more contrasty image. And you can see, as I start to push that up, where we have detail like in the mountain range, in the clouds, in the grass and everything, anything that has a good strong contrast will start to increase the darkness in that contrast, therefore making everything look considerably more contrasty. So that's a pretty cool way of dealing with things like that. The highlights do exactly what its name suggests. If you've got something that looks a little blown out, we can pull the highlights back and that'll sort of bring back the highlights a little bit. So if you do find something's blown out or looks blown out, chances are with modern cameras these days, there's still a lot of dynamic information in there, dynamic range in there that you can pull back by using the highlights. Alternatively, like I say, you can go the opposite way and push your highlights up. Now, one of the cool things about this, if you want to make sure you don't start clipping those highlights or shadows or whites or blacks, if you hold the Alt key down on the keyboard when you adjust the slider, you'll see it gives you a black representation of the image. Now, as we push that up, anything that starts to get clipped out will start to go blue. Now, you can't really see it on there because it's only a tiny, tiny little bit. But let's just say, let's put that back to where it was and do the same thing with the white. So I'll hold the Alt key down on the keyboard, drag the whites up, and you can see, once we start to get that blue, that's starting to get close to being clipped highlights. When it goes white, we're basically blowing that part of the image out. Now, once we let go of that, take a look at the histogram in the top, and you can see over on the highlight side, the right-hand side of the image, you can see we've got this completely flat flush against the right-hand side. That's telling us that we basically, we've clipped the highlights in a particular part of the image. But being non-destructive, it makes no difference. We can simply drag that slider back down, hold the Alt key if we want to, to adjust that to get it to a point where there's no clipping, but we've pushed those whites up as far as they can go without clipping. Same goes with the blacks. If we hold the Alt key down on the blacks, start to drop that down to the left-hand side, you will get a white representation of the screen. And you can see once we start to get to the point of clipping those blacks, you can see it now goes black on screen. And the further we push it, the more we sort of see the different color information that shows us we're starting to get close to clipping. Black means we've clipped it for the blacks and the shadows. White means we've clipped it for the highlights and the whites. So you can see, you can make sure that even if your monitor isn't perfectly well calibrated or you don't have the best monitor in the world, you can still ensure that you don't clip those highlights or shadows, blacks or whites, by using this simple method. So we'll double click back on that. Okay, so we've got some basics there. Let's just take a look at fine-tuning this image to get a little bit more, a little closer to what we might like it to be. So we can use these in conjunction with each other. So we push the whites up, and we get the point of almost clipping. So for example, we take a look at this, we started to clip in there. What we can do is we can use the highlights and push those over to the left-hand side, and we can then compensate for anything that's clipping. So what we're doing is we're protecting those highlights but still pushing up the whites. So it's a balance between the highlights and the whites or the shadows and the blacks. So you can darken the areas you want down without making them go completely black, or you can do the same with the highlights by using the shadows and the blacks or the whites and the highlights. I hope that kind of makes sense, but it's a good way of balancing things off to make sure you get a great end result. Speaking of end results, we just made a couple of simple alterations to the contrast, the highlights, the whites. Let's take a look at before and after. So this was the beginning. So you can see, a little bit flat, a little bit dull. Just that simple alteration, we've given it a much more punch to the image just by making a couple of simple alterations. And we do the same thing with the shadows. We can simply come in, pull the blacks down a little, making sure that we don't start clipping. So if we do, we can then use the shadows to ensure that those areas don't clip out. So 
very easy to start manipulating things and making sure that you don't end up making a complete mess of your image. But if you do, everything is non-destructive, so you can simply just reset it or double-click any of those sliders to put them back to their default setting. So now that we've taken a look at the basics of the light panel, we've got the tone curve we can take a look at. Now I've covered the tone curve in its own dedicated video, and I'll link that in the description below. If you really want to see how to start utilizing this to its full extent, I'd recommend checking that video. It's going to give you tons more detail than I can cover in this particular video. Links in the description. Okay, so basically we have five different modes we can work with the tone curve. We've got the tone curve as it is at the moment, where this is broken down to five different sections. You've got your blacks, You've got your shadows, you've got your mid-tones, you've got your highlights, and you've got your whites. So we can simply manipulate that, and you can see that if we grab any of these, it's given us a representation of what kind of tonal information in the image is going to be affected. So if we grab the center point and we start to bring that down, we're taking the midpoint and we're darkening things down. So you can see we're dragging that down darkening everything down. But you can also probably see that I don't really get a huge amount of control over what's going on. If I lift this up, it creates the curve for me. So I'm not really in control of what's being done. So I don't tend to work in this mode. So we can reset that. And we'll just get everything back to where it was. And to do that, all we need to do is right click and we can say reset or reset all. So let's just reset that back to where it was. So that's put the tone curve back now to its basic original starting point. The better way of working is to switch this over to the point curve mode. Now, what the point curve mode allows us to do is physically add our own points and then we can manipulate those points easily. So let's put a point in the center. So you can see now I've added that in and that's directly in the middle or the midpoint of our entire tonal information in the image. So if I start to drag that down, you'll see we create a much more natural curve. So it's getting a curve that's not being influenced in the shadow area, it's not being influenced in the highlights, it's simply dragging down and creating a nice smooth curve. Alternatively, I can drag that up and we'll just lighten all the midpoint with this nice roll off. We can also add additional points in there and start manipulating however we see fit. So let's just say, for example, I want to crush the blacks to make sure that the blacks are not black, they become slightly gray. Well, I can do that. I can just add a point down in the black point, drag that up, and that just effectively lightens all the black point in the image. So you can see through this method, we can very quickly and easily adjust in conjunction with the light panel to get much more control but like I say, this is one of those things that you really need to understand how the tone curve works. So I'd recommend checking that video out. Okay, so let's just right click and reset that. So let's just say reset all channels. So that puts it back to where we started. The next three options are where we can influence the color. So the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel, the RGB channels in our image. So you can click on there. And you can see that if we want to influence the colors now, as opposed to the tonal information in the image, then this is how we can do it. So we could say we want to take all of our mid-tone information and push that to introduce more red into it. So we can add a point into the center, drag that up towards the red, which is the top left-hand side. And you see now the overall image starts to take on a much more red hue. We can do the opposite. We can bring that down and the opposite color we can start to introduce a sort of teal color into it. So you can see, again, we can easily go in and start manipulating colors. And this is where the power of the tone curve comes in, is that you, have, you can introduce sort of information into the colors. You can adjust colors. You can adjust those colors inside their tone areas as well. So you might want to adjust the colors inside the shadows or the black point. Well, you can do that using this method. Like I say, check the video out, the dedicated video, to get a lot more information on this. So we'll leave that where it is for now, and we move on to the next panel, which is the color panel. So next up, we have the color panel, and the color panel gives us a lot of control over the colors in our image. It also allows us to create black and white images. So let's take a quick look at this. Again, we've got a couple of switches at the top that allows us to adjust and switch over to additional functions. You can see we can click into black and white mode. That then changes the slides we have available to us and puts the image into black and white. We can click, put that back to color. As you can see, everything is non-destructive. The other option we've got then is the color mixer, which we can click and open that up, and it gives us a huge amount more control over the colors and how we can influence and change the hue, saturation, or luminance of any of the colors in the image that we're working with. We'll come and take a look at that in a moment. So other than that, we've also got the white balance option, and we've got the white balance picker. Now, what this allows us to do is to change the white balance of the shot. Now, normally, when you deal with more expensive cameras, if you're shooting in RAW, you're going to have the option, doesn't matter what white balance you choose, it's completely, it's just sort of 
stored alongside the file. It's not committed to the file. So if you choose the wrong white balance, you could be shooting in tungsten, but you're actually outside in sunlight. Then you're going to find your image is going to have a strange color cast. If you're shooting in JPEG, that information has been committed to the file. If you're shooting in RAW, it doesn't matter. It's completely independent. So you can see if we wanted to, we can just choose the eyedropper, for example. We can come down to our image and we can look for something that gives us a sort of neutral gray, a sort of 18% gray. You can see we get a little sort of loop kind of view on this so we can see what we're actually going to select. And if I click on that, you can see the color temperature of the image changes. If I choose a different part, you can see we warm it up. If we choose a different area, it cools it down. And you can see what's happening is the temperature and the tint are being adjusted. So we can create our own custom white balance. And if you're using a, a sort of a custom color card, then you can easily just select the midpoint gray on there and you know your colors are going to be perfectly spot on again you're going to find that if you don't use a calibrated monitor you could be getting thrown out a little bit by what your monitors display and not necessarily what you're seeing so bear that thing in mind as well so let's just reset those back to where they were so underneath this we've got as shot or we've got auto or custom so there's not a massive amount of options in there like you have with the desktop version you know sort of Lightroom CC classic or earlier versions of Lightroom where you have a lot of options in there but you can customize it if you need to speaking of which the next lot of sliders allow us to customize the temperature and the tint now the temperature allows us to push things over to make them cooler if we go to the left hand side so we will introduce more blue into the image if we want to warm things up we can push it over to the right hand side so as an example if we push this over you can see we start to get a much cooler much bluer looking image again if we push that over to the right hand side we start to get a much more yellow a much warmer image double click resets that so this for me wants to cool down just a tiny, tiny bit. So around about there it looks a little better. Then the tint does pretty much the same kind of thing, but only this time with the greens and the magentas. So if we push that over to the left hand side, we introduce a green cast in. If we push it over to the right hand side, we introduce more magenta into it. Now generally you're gonna find the temperature is what you'll adjust more often than you'll tend to sort of work with the tint. But you've got those tools there should you need them. Next up, we've got the vibrance and saturation. Now, if I go to saturation first, it does exactly as its name suggests. It'll increase the amount of color saturation across the entire image, no matter what color. So your greens will be greener, your blues will be bluer, your reds will be redder, and so on. It's indiscriminate. Whereas the vibrance will actually take things like skin tones and so on, the warmer colors in the image, and actually accentuate those. So you can see it's a slightly different effect. So you can see the things like the greens get a little bit more lush, but they don't become intensely green, sort of become fake as it were. Obviously, if you go too far with that, it can go a little silly, but it does allow you to sort of easily tweak your, your image to get those natural, nice, warm colors, warm tones in your image without oversaturating every single part of the image that you're working with. So you will find on color images, especially things like landscapes or portraits where you've got human skin, vibrance is a great starting point when you want to adjust anything to do with the colors in there. If you want more control than that, then obviously you've got the color mixer option underneath. Now you can see the color mixer gives us the ability to adjust the color, the hue, the saturation, or the luminance. So if we switch to hue, for example, you can see we now get all the sliders to do with the hue. Same goes for the saturation, same goes for the luminance. However, the color works slightly differently. It gives you all of those tools, all of those options. But what it does is it breaks them down to the com composite colors. So you've got your red, you've got your green, and you've got your blue. But you've also got orange, you've got yellow, you've got cyan, magenta, and so on. So you've got additional options in there which you can then pick and choose and adjust the hue and saturation. So for example, if we wanted to change this grass, we can look, take a look at the sort of component colors on there. That would be yellow and green. So we choose the yellow, for example. We can grab the hue and we can push that over. So you can see if we take that over to the right hand side, we start to strip out the actual natural yellow tones that are inside the grass. Alternatively, if we push that over to the right hand side, we start to introduce more orangey tones into it. So we sort of go through the yellow, through the orange, and maybe even touch upon the reds. So you can tweak the hue on there. So let's just say we want to sort of introduce just a little bit more yellow in it, make it a little bit more lush. If you make it too green, it kind of looks a little fake and unnatural, a bit like AstroTurf. Next up, we've got the saturation. Now the saturation is only going to influence the color that's selected. In this case, we've got the yellow, which is kind of pushed a little over to the orange range. So if we start to bump the saturation up, only that is going to be affected. So we'll oversaturate that particular color. 
the luminance is more the sort of tonal value. So in other words, if we take this to the left, we'll take those shades and make them darker. If we take them to the right, we make them lighter. So you can see, if you look at the grass, those yellow tones start to be brought out a lot more. So if you have things like yellow flowers, for example, we've got these little yellow flowers in the foreground, it'll start to accentuate those. So we take this on and off. We can turn on and off the color mixer. You can see the difference that's being made to this. So you can easily come in and start tweaking colors. This is a great way of dealing with things like grass. Again, skin tones, the orange color works really, really well for skin tones. So let's just say, for example, you wanted to adjust the sort of the reddish kind of orangey colors in there. Well, we can come into that. We can adjust the saturation on those. And anything you can see, if you take a look at the mountain range, there's some orangey kind of tones that are in there. So if we start to push those up, we start to bring more color into those, bring the luminous down to darken those down, or sort of brighten them up by taking it to the right-hand side. And you can see these sort of natural formations in the rock. They're starting to change color. So let's take a look before and after. Fairly subtle, but you can see we're targeting those just by using the color mixer. Okay, so I still think my image looks a little warm, so I'm gonna come back up to the temperature slider. I'm going to bring that over to the left hand side just a little more, introduce a bit more coolness into it. Okay, so we've kind of finished with the color section. I'm not going to worry too much about the black and white. We can switch that on and we can start to create black and white images. So that's pretty self explanatory. Let's take a look at the effects section. Now, the effects section is pretty cool. We've got some really nice options in here. Clarity and dehaze are great tools. You need to be careful with them because they can really, really degrade an image if you're not careful. So let's take a look at dehaze first of all. Now dehaze is fantastic for two purposes. One, as its name suggests, if you have a natural haze in the image, so let's just say for example, you have a mountain range sort of three or four levels back in your image and they kind of just look a little bit flat and dull, then you can use the dehaze to sort of just grab the contrast in there and accentuate that. Anything that's kind of grayed out will be brought sort of more to the forefront. So it's great for that side of things. You can also use it as a sort of super-powered contrast. So let's just say, for example, I don't really have anything that's, that's sort of affected by the haze in this. But if I start to drag this over to the right-hand side, you'll see that the image starts to darken down, but we also get considerably more contrast in it. So we take a look at the sort of the differences in the rocks. You can see we get a super sort of contrasty look there. So you need to be careful with that. Alternatively, we do the opposite way. It'll kind of introduce haze into the image. So it kind of looks a little bit flat as if you'd really taken the contrast and sucked that out of the image. So there's a couple of ways you can use that. And we'll take a look at that in its own dedicated video further down the line. But just know that you can use it for that contrast side of things as well as what its name suggests, which is to do with taking out haze and things in your images. Next up, you've got clarity. Now, what clarity does is, again, this is sort of like a super-powered uh, contrast, but not quite to the extent of what the dehaze does. So you can see if we start to push this up, we start to get a lot more contrast in the sort of contrasty areas of the image. So we've got this nice stark contrast of the sort of almost black to the almost white. It really does help to accentuate that particular effect. So again, you need to be careful with this because what it can do is if you've got high contrast areas, you can tend to introduce some weird artifacts in there. So use it sparingly, but use it in conjunction with either the dehaze or the contrast. Next up, you've got your vignette. And your vignette, as its name suggests, will allow you to bring in darker edges or lighter edges. So let's take a look at that. If we drag that over to the left-hand side, you can see we start to darken off these edges, which is a great way of drawing attention into the main focal point of your image. Now, the opposite effect of that is where you take it over to the right-hand side, and what that does is that lightens off the edges. So you can see we start to take the edges and make them all the way to white. So kind of as that retro kind of photograph effect. So let's reset that. You've also got these little options that give you additional tools and additional options and functions for this particular function. There's a lot of functions. So you can see, once we start to introduce a vignette, and let's just pull that in to make it quite extensive, you've then got the option to increase or decrease the feather. Now the feather is how smooth the transition is between the darkest areas of the vignette and the unaffected areas of the vignette. So if you want to have quite a large transition, so make everything really, really smooth, you can increase that. Alternatively, you can decrease it to get a very hard edge. You can see if we bring that down, right the way down, we no longer have any feathering on there and we have this sort of like you're looking through a window kind of effect. So that's the feathering and then you've got the midpoint, the roundness and the highlights and so on. 
I'm not going to get into too much detail about that, but you can adjust those should you see fit. And I recommend playing about with them and see what they do for you. Just close that down. Next up, and finally, we've got the grain option. Now, again, as its name suggests, this is pretty self-explanatory. It's going to introduce grain into the image. You've also got some additional options. So we can expand that out, and you can see we've got grain. And once we bring some grain into the image, you would see we've then got the option for size and roughness. So let's just zoom in so we can see exactly what's going on. So let's find an area like we've got the sky. So you should be able to see, if I take that back to where it was, there's no real grain in this image. We've got nice, smooth transitions. Everything looks pretty cool. If we start to introduce grain in, you should start to see that we get a simulated film grain effect. So if you were using higher ISO films years and years and years ago, then you'd have this sort of grain effect that we brought in. Now this works really well if you've got black and white images and you want to create a gritty kind of effect. Great for concert photography or low light photography. So you can introduce grain into the image. You can then adjust the size of that grain so you can make it larger. So you can see that brings in a much larger grain effect. Or you can take it down to the left hand side and make it much more subtle, much smaller grain effect. Put that back to where it was and then you've got the roughness. So as his name suggests is, as you sort of bring this over to the left-hand side, you get this more sort of uniform effect, which isn't the nicest. It looks like a kind of leather effect. If you take it over to the right-hand side, we get a much more rough, much grainier effect. So you can find the balance between using the grain, the size, and the roughness to recreate the sort of film effect that you might want to create with this particular tool. Let's just reset that. I don't want any grain in there. Let's just close those options down. Zoom back out. Okay, so that's how you deal with the effects panel. So there's some pretty cool things in there. Even though they look first glance, they look pretty sort of plain and boring. You can use those to get some amazing looking effects in your photographs. So next up, we've got the detail panel. Now this is where you go in and start to sharpen the image that you're working with. So let's just zoom in and take a look at what we have we're working with. Now this is a pretty sharp image to start off with. So you can see that on the detail panel, we've got sharpening, we've got noise reduction, and we've got color noise reduction. So again, if you're going back to shooting images with quite high ISO in low light situations, then noise can be a contributing factor and something you may not want in all of your image. So if you've got things like skies or you've got solid colors, they can really show noise up quite badly. And this is a great way, an easy way of dealing with that. Now, each one of these panels has the option to toggle down and see additional options in there. So let's start off with the sharpening. Let's expand that out and see what we have. So you've got sharpening, which is the amount of sharpening being applied. The radius is the number of pixels that are going to be sharpened. So you can see by default, we've got one pixel. I highly recommend, unless in extreme circumstances, one pixel radius should be more than enough for pretty much everything you want to do. You can experiment with it, but the larger you go, the more extreme the sharpening gets and the more unnatural it can look. So be careful using the radius. The detail is how much detail is kind of kept in the image. So the more sharpening that's applied, you could start to lose detail. So you can use the detail slider to make sure that you retain the important details in your image. And finally, the masking. Now, the masking is one of those tools that kind of like it can cause confusion. But what it really does is it allows you to fine tune what edges are going to be sharpened. Because what the sharpening is doing is it's looking at the contrast between the parts of your image. So high contrast areas will start to get more sharpening. And you can use the masking control to apply how much sharpening is going to be applied to the overall image. So the lower to the left you've got that more of your image is going to be sharpened, which might sound like a good thing, but the reality is it doesn't tend to sort of give great effects. You're better off pushing that over to the right-hand side where it looks at the contrast edges and introduces sharpening into those contrasty areas. Now, let me just show you what I mean by that. Again, we can use that holding the Alt key down to get additional tools. Let's apply some sharpening. Now, you can't really see too much because I've only applied a small amount of sharpening, but there is sharpening being applied. Now, if I hold the Alt key down on the keyboard, you can see when I drag the masking over, this is now showing us a contrast simulation of what's going to be affected. So what we're looking to do is find those nice contrasty edges. So you can see the white is the areas that are going to be sharpened. The black is going to be left untouched. So as we push this over, you can see, because obviously we're dealing with quite a detailed sort of image at the moment, we're controlling what's going to be sharpened. So this is going to be sharpened. But if we sort of scroll to the sky, hold the Alt key down again, you can see none of the sky is really going to be sharpened, which is exactly what we want, because there's nothing that really needs to be sharpened in there. It's all very soft edges. So we start to sharpen that. We introduce crazy-looking weird artifacts into it, and it just doesn't look very good. 
So this is the easy way of dealing with it, holding that Alt key down and using this tool so you can see just by sliding that over what's going to be affected. So if we take this over to the left hand side, you can see pretty much all the image is going to be affected, which isn't necessarily the best way. We can do the same thing with the detail. We can hold that down and you can see this gives us sort of an unsharp mask effect. So as we sort of take that over to the right hand side, let's just zoom in until we see a bit better. You can see there's a huge amount of detail that's going to be sharpened in there and it doesn't look very good. So by using the detail slider, you can just make sure we get a nice fine balance between the amount of detail you want to sharpen and the amount of detail you want to be left alone, as it were. Radius, you could use the same on there. Sharpening, you can see what that does. That switches to black and white to reduce any color information to sort of cause any confusion when you're sharpening. Now, I've already done a video dedicated to sharpening, which is in Lightroom, the desktop version, but the tools are exactly the same. So I'll link that in the description below so you can get a much more detailed description of what's going on and how to sharpen your images the best way. But hopefully this has given you a sort of an insight into what those tools do and how you can utilize them to get really nice sharp end results. So let's just drag that masking right the way up there to about there just to make sure I don't sharpen things I don't want to sharpen. Okay, we're looking pretty good. Let's just toggle that back up. Now, noise reduction, there's not really any noise in this image, nothing to really write home about. But again, like I said, you can expand this out and you've got noise reduction and you've got color noise reduction. Now, these are two different types of noise and depending upon the image, if you've got color noise reduction, you'll see that because it'll have sort of colors, red, greens and blue, pixels in there and you'll very quickly see it you can use the color noise reduction for that normal noise which is sort of a grain effect you can just use the noise reduction so like i say i'm not going to too much detail on that we'll leave that as is next up we've got the optics section now the optics is when you shoot your lens has its own specific characteristics. Now that might be one of those things that means that you get some kind of distortion. You could have distortion on the edges, you could have some vignetting. There's lots of different things. All different types of lenses will have their own optical characteristics. And what this does is it looks at a database of the most common, most popular lenses, and it will try to compensate for any kind of effects that that lens will apply to your image. So if you shoot in wide angle, it'll try to get rid of those sort of fall off sort of vignetting effects on the edges, but also get rid of some of that distortion. So I'd recommend that if you shot the image yourself, try the remove chromatic aberration, try the enable lens correction, let it see if it picks up the actual lens that you were using. If it doesn't, you can customize and adjust this yourself if you want. You can see we've got distortion correction and we've got lens vignetting. Those sort of two key things. Now I didn't shoot this image, so I don't have that option available. It's probably already been done anyway. So I'll deselect that. The chromatic aberration, again, this is something that isn't evident in this particular image, but some lenses, cheaper lenses will sort of display it even more. And what chromatic aberration is, is basically where you get the sort of purple fringing around the edge of high contrast areas or sort of blue fringing around it. And what this will do is it'll try to compensate for that. It'll look at the image, look at those high contrast areas and compensate for that and reduce it as much as is human possible so it's worthwhile applying those to your image and seeing what they do at the bare minimum I'd always recommend using the chromatic aberration to remove that even if your lens isn't supported okay so that's the optic section and finally we've got the geometry now geometry is where if you're dealing with shooting something like a, a sort of cityscape you'll know yourself that things will happen like converging verticals. In other words, as you look up, as things get further away, their straight lines start to converge towards the top. This will allow you to easily go in and correct for that. You have the option for things like guided, auto, level, vertical, and full. Try them out. They're pretty self-explanatory. Most of them automatic anyway. The only one that really isn't is the sort of the guided where you'll draw guidelines on it. And again, I've got a video tutorial on how to use that. I'll link that in the description below so you can see how to use that. And that's basically the first panel covered. So we've gone through the real meat and bones of what you can do with Lightroom. Now let's take a look at some of the other tools that are available to us. So next up, we've got the cropping options. So I click on there and you can see we can crop, we can straighten, we can rotate, we can flip. Really easy, in all honesty. I've done a dedicated video on this that again, I'll put in the link in the description below so you can check that out. But the honest fact is it's really, really easy to work with. You simply leaving everything set as it is at the moment, you come and grab any of these handles, top, left, right, bottom, center, wherever you want, and drag it down, and that will allow you to crop the image. Again, like I say, this is all non-destructive, so if you want to change the crop at a later date, you can simply come back into the crop module, activate that, all these crop handles will 
reappear and you can simply readjust your crop so really cool really easy if you want to reposition where the crop applies you can just simply come inside the crop area you see the hand symbol click and hold on your left mouse button and then you can reposition that as you see fit once you're happy you can simply press the enter key to commit that or just close the panel down now let's just revert that back to its original you've also got some other options you've got the aspect ratio so we've got popular screen sizes or screen ratios as well as photographic ratios so things like 8 by 10s 5 by 7s and so on also things like 16 by 9 so by choosing any of those you'll see that the crop handles will resize to keep that aspect ratio now you can resize as you see fit based upon that particular aspect so more like a cinematic effect there we go there's a cinematic effect let's reset that if we want to flip so at the moment we've got a landscape image we might, might want to do a portrait crop well we can simply hit the flip and we're now in portrait mode and we can then go in if we want to and choose any of these options so one to one for example so that's going to create a square crop come back in and say we want an 8 by 10 so you can see we can just flip those around any way we want very quick very easy reset that final option on there is the constraint aspect ratio once that's selected then we'll know that no matter how good our mouse control is it will keep that ratio so in this example for example the the 8 by 10 or something however if you unlock that we now have free reign to create any kind of crop we want we're not limited to an aspect ratio so again really really easy we can reset that we've also got the option to rotate and straighten so if we find that our horizon isn't straight for example we can easily use this we can also come in and directly input a value to get exactly what we want Finally, we've got the options then to do things like to rotate left, rotate right, and we've got flip horizontal, flip vertical, you know, all as you'd expect. So we click it, it flips it, click it, it flips it, rotates it, rotates it. Pretty self-explanatory. Nothing really rocket science involved in there. So that's the crop panel. Pretty cool. So next up, we've got the healing brush. So let's open that panel up. Now, this is a pretty simple and straightforward tool. We've got clone and we've got heal. Now, clone, as his name suggests, will allow us to clone certain parts of things, whereas the heel will allow us to correct any sort of mistake in the image. So let's just zoom in to something. So let's go to one to one. Let's just say, for example, we wanted to deal with these couple of little flowers we've got. Then what we can do is we can adjust the brush size. So you can see I can use the scroll wheel or I can use the slider, whatever I want. The feather is basically how soft the edges are going to be. So if we take that over to the left-hand side, we're going to get a very hard edge. Whereas if we take it over to the right-hand side, we start to feather that out. And you should hopefully be able to see that we've got sort of two circles now. The inner circle and the outer circle is denoting how much sort of softening is being applied to the edges of it. And opacity, exactly as him suggests, is it deals with the opacity of the actual brush, the effect that we're doing when we're healing or cloning. So we'll leave that at 100 We'll bring the feathering down a little bit. Size is probably a little too large. Let's just reduce that down. And let's just take a look. Say we've got these three little flowers. We want to get rid of those. So just simply hold the left mouse button down, paint over those. And you can see what it does is it now shows us there's our target and there's our source. So we can easily reposition either of those. So we might say, well, we've kind of missed the flowers. Let's position that where we want. Uh, I might say, well, I don't want any of those sort of flowers in there. I want just plain grass so I can drag the second part and you can see now it'll update and we've now got rid of those flowers so you can see very easy very easy to do same again let's just go to this stone over on the right hand side click on there you can see it now pulls up where things is the best source i think a better source will be down here click and let go give it a second or so to sort of refresh itself and there we go we're pretty much done let's move that over a little bit because we kind of duplicate in the little flower or stone but there it looks a bit weird and there you go we very quickly and easily healed different things that we didn't want to see in the image this is a great way if you've got dust or you've got dust bunnies on there or stones or just things you want to kind of get rid of it's very easy to deal with using the healing or the clone brush the next tool we have is the brush tool now the brush tool is one of those things that has a huge amount of power associated with it the brush tool is basically as his name suggests it allows you to paint effects now that could be you want to paint a color change you might want to paint to make part of the image cooler or warmer by using the tint or the temperature. You might want to over or underexpose something. So it's pretty much the same as kind of doing a dodge and burn effect. Tons and tons of options. So you'll see that once we select the brush, we now have some options available. 
we've got things like temperature, tint, exposure, contrast, and so on. So you, what you should see is that a lot of the tools that are available in the develop module, right at the top where we've got the edit options, are all available in here. So clarity, dehaze, saturation, and so on. So what we can do is we can use the brush and paint those effects on. So let me just give you an example. Let me just take the saturation and prick that right the way down. Make my brush a little larger. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to simply paint an area. And as I start to paint, you'll see as I keep painting, we start to paint the color away. So what we're doing is we're effectively painting desaturation. So we're desaturating it by using a paintbrush. So this allows you to get very selective in where you want these particular effects to be taking place. Great if you want to do things like skin smoothing. You can take things like the, the clarity slider, reduce that down, and then you can paint onto the face to create nice, smooth skin tones. Now, when you're working with the paintbrush, in much the same way as you could move the clone and the heel brush around, you can do the same thing with this. So you can see when we take our mouse over, once we've got this tool active, any area that we're using a brush, you can see with this little blue dot. Now we can create multiple brushes and we can apply the effect and different effects all over our image just by simply clicking on the plus, but plus button to create a new brush. But what we can do is we can move this around. So let's just say, for example, we've done something and then we crop the picture or we do something and we need to move that effect. Well, all we need to do is come over the little blue dot, grab that with the left mouse button, drag it to reposition it where we want. Very, very easy. You can see if we take our mouse over, you'll see it now shows us in a red overlay, and that's the actual area that's been affected. And because we've got a soft brush, we've got feathering on there, you can see we don't have any hard edges. So it's really cool. We can also come up and we can use the eraser, and this does the complete opposite. This will paint away the effect that we put on there. So you can see as I start painting and hold the mouse button down, we now start to reintroduce the color back in there. So in other words, we're taking out that desaturation effect by painting away the areas that we've covered with saturation. So if you're used to working with masks inside Photoshop, this kind of technology is going to be very familiar with you. It's like working with quick masks, and the red overlay is very similar to the way quick masks work in Photoshop. So by painting things on and using the eraser to remove them, it's like using a mask. Nothing is permanent. It can be adjusted, corrected, removed, whatever you want to do with it. Now, the brush also has some additional options. So if we come up, you can see we've got this little toggle arrow. Click to show more options, and you can see we've got size, feather, in exactly the same way as we did with the clone. We've also got flow and density. We've also got the option for auto mask. Now, I've covered this in a lot more detail in its own dedicated video, but the auto mask technically looks at the edges of the contrast. So, for example, if you're painting on someone's face, you might want to... Make sure that you don't go over onto the background, for example. Don't want to spill over onto the background, the effect you're doing. By checking the auto mask, what Lightroom will do is it'll look at the contrast edges, look where you're painting, and attempt to do a really good job of creating a mask effect. So let's just say, for example, I wanted to paint this on. I'm going to reduce our brush size down, reduce the feather down. I don't want to have anywhere near that amount of feather. We leave everything else as it is, but I'll just check the auto mask. What we're going to do is we're going to increase the exposure. So you see nothing's happening at the moment apart from this area because we've got that as a brush we've already created. So we can click on that, delete that, that gets rid of it completely. Let's try that again. So that's got rid of that. So what we're going to do now is we're going to come back on, we're going to click to add a new brush, and what we're going to do is we're going to start painting over our figure. Now, what you should start to see is because I've adjusted the exposure, the black areas should start to lighten up and obviously on his legs, his feet, and so on. So I'm just painting onto there to try to get just the man a little lighter, because he was a little too dark, but obviously everything else I'm quite happy with. So you can see now we've done that, we've applied that, but we haven't made any effect on the sort of the ice or the water behind or the grass or the earth or anything, because the auto mask has enough contrast there to know that we want to paint just on the areas that we're going over. So you can see if I take my mouse over that little blue dot, we get a red mask that shows us all the areas that have been affected. As you can see, it's not spilling over onto the background. It's pretty much all contained inside our figure. And that's how the auto mask works. Just make sure that when you don't want that to take effect, you just want to be sort of quite liberal with your effect, that you don't have the auto mask applied. Because what that'll do is it really does slow down your whole process of painting because it's trying to mask at the same time as you're trying to apply the effect. So on a slower computer, it can get a little bit slow and unwieldy. So just make sure you use that. 
And that's the brush tool. All those different options down there only apply to the area that's been brushed onto the part of the image that you want. I hope that makes sense. Like I say, it's a very, very powerful tool. Really something you want to get into using when you want to get selective on your edits. So now that we've taken a look at the brush tool, we've now got the option for the linear gradient. Now the linear gradient on first look may look very much the same as the actual brush tool. And in a certain respect, it does work in a very similar fashion. The only difference is we can't, obviously can't paint directly onto the image. We're going to create a gradient. Now that gradient, the effect that's going to happen is based upon what the slider is doing. So at the moment, you can see we've got saturation set to minus 100 and exposure set to almost plus two stops. So if I create a gradient now, it's going to desaturate wherever I place that gradient. It's also going to put an exposure bump in there. Now obviously I don't want to do that. So what I'm going to do is set these back to zero. Make sure the linear gradient is selected, and we're simply going to drag down the screen. Now, if you hold the shift key down on the keyboard, you'll constrain this to make sure that it goes perfectly straight. So you can see what happens is we get three lines. Now, these lines pretty much just show you the gradient, the graduation between the maximum effect and no effect. So what we're seeing is anything above this top line is going to be completely affected by whatever we do on the sliders on the right-hand side. Anything that's below the bottom line, nothing's going to happen. But what happens in between the two is going to be basically a soft graduation. So we can reposition this if you want to grab in that blue dot. You also see if we take our mouse over, we get the red overlay showing us the masked area where these effects are going to take place. And you can see a visual representation of what I've just said. So what we can do now is we can just simply come in and just do things like alter the exposure. So you can see we now start to bring a huge amount more detail into the sky without really affecting anything to do with the actual mid ground or the foreground. So that's pretty cool. If we find it has too much of an effect, we can simply bring that up further up. So we start to reduce the effect. We can also grab these any of the sort of the top or bottom lines. And what we do is if we click and hold and then just drag, we reduce the actual amount of graduation that we see. In other words, we make it a much quicker graduation between the full effect and no effect. Obviously, this is dependent upon the image you're working with. And most of the time, if you're dealing with things like skies and that, a nice smooth graduation is going to work really well. But sometimes you don't want that. You want to have that sort of hard edge. You can do that very easily. You're not limited to this being perfectly straight. You can easily come in and you can rotate this to any angle you want. So again, like I say, you've got tons of control over there. Just undo that a second. Okay, so now that we've done that, we've just dropped the exposure down on there. We can now do things like we can say, well, let's just bump the clarity up on that to get some real nice strong contrast in there we might say well let's bring a little bit of dehaze into there just to really bump that contrast and you can see what happens if we go a little too far and this isn't taking too much in the way of the dehaze this is only sort of plus 20 or so you can see it has quite a marked effect on the image so we need to be careful what we're doing there once we've done that we can do things like we can use the contrast if we want to we can do things like the highlights. We can make sure we push those highlights or we protect them by pulling things back a little bit. But you can see we've created a much more dramatic sky with a couple of simple alterations and just using that gradient, that linear gradient over the sky itself. Let's bring that down a little more. Just making sure that we get exactly what we want on there. So that looks pretty cool. Now there's a little tip for you. You can see that we're starting to obviously influence the mountain range, which we may not actually want to do. So what we could do is simply come up to where we've got our shadows and we can push those up. And what that's going to do is it's going to lift those shadows a little bit and make sure that the blacks are not quite so dark in there. So we can compensate for things along those lines. So that's pretty cool. That's very, very easy to do using the gradient tool. So now that we've seen the brush tool and how that works, and we've seen the linear gradient and how that works, we've got one other tool that works in a very similar fashion, and that's the radial gradient. So we click on there, you can see that activates the radial gradient. Same options we had in the linear gradient are now evident in there. It also retains the last settings that we used. So we can reset those if we want to. Double click on any of those and it'll reset everything back to where it was originally. So quick and easy. So what the radial gradient does is pretty much exactly the same thing but in a radial fashion. So if I just click, drag that out, you can see we now create a circle or an ellipse, anything that's just basically radial. So we can do that. We can reposition it if we want to, just by grabbing that little blue dot. Any of these little resize or reshape handles, we can grab those and adjust things on there. So you can see what we can do now is we can sort of focus on our character. 
At the moment, you can see if we take our mouse over, everything outside is being affected or protected. We might not want to do that. We can invert this if we want to. So you can simply click on there, come back over, and you'll see now that what's masked or protected is the actual inside of the circle. So with that inverted, if we just zoom in, so let's go to one-to-one -to -one, so we can see what we're doing. So now let's just say, for example, I want to affect the darker areas of this. You can see that we've got the little bit of earth there and obviously the clothing he's wearing. So what we could do is we could come over to the shadows, for example, and we could just sort of lift those up. And you can see as we do that, we start to lift those shadows up, but only inside that circular area. Now, obviously, if we find we're just influencing a little too much, we can simply come in and adjust this circle just to get exactly what we want. And when we've got that nice feathered edge, we know we're going to get a nice smooth graduation between the sort of affected area and the unaffected area. Obviously, it depends what you're doing on here. If we started playing about with the saturation, for example, then that's going to affect the outside because that's where there's more color. So not just his legs are going to be affected, the actual water itself and is going to be affected as well. So this is where you'd use the paintbrush and this is where you'd go in and use the, the auto mask and so on. But you can see, again, it's a really easy way of working. And another great tool that we've got inside Lightroom CC. And there we go. That pretty much wraps up what we've got inside Lightroom CC. That's your quick start guide to how you can work inside Lightroom CC. So let's just quickly take a look at the before and the after and just see some of the things we've done. Now, obviously, this isn't a final image. I spent a lot more time working on this. But what I wanted to do was just show you some of the main tools, how you use them and how you can quickly edit the image very easily. So this is the before. As you can see, it looks a little bit flat and washed out. This is the after. We didn't make that many tweaks to it, but we made a massive effect to the tone and the colors and everything else inside the image itself. So that's how you use Lightroom CC. That's a quick start guide to get in the most out of Lightroom CC quickly and easily. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button. Don't forget to click on the bell icon to be notified every time a new video is uploaded to the channel. If you have any comments, questions, or feedback on this video, or anything you'd like to see covered on the channel, please pop those in the comments section below. And until next time, take care.